Good morning, happy Sabbath again. Ah, you know, such a blessing for us to be here together. I oh, sometimes you know we talk about how do we how do we talk to people, how do we share the gospel. But thank goodness we can come here freely and talk with each other. And some things that we think about all week, we can share with each other at least, and and it really solidifies us uh, in our minds, and we know that God's working with us. Let's bow our head real, uh, and have a quick word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you again for being with us on the Sabbath day. And we thank you, Father, for allowing us to come together and, and congregate with one another. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit may come down and speak to us. Dear Lord, through this word, we pray that you will speak to our hearts and speak to our minds and give us peace. Thank you, Lord, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the Beatitudes, Jesus' very first time that he's preaching to the people. He has a new mission, and he meets in Capernaum. And um, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy is, is our start of our lesson today. This is another picture that my son took in, in uh, Israel. And... Um, and uh, uh, kind of a special place there with all the uh, memories and everything that happens there. I'm glad that he's given me some pictures so I can visualize being there. You know, in the past uh, couple of weeks, we've been learning about the Beatitudes. The first Beatitude is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall, uh, their, theirs is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And then, Blessed are the, um, those that mourn, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for, uh, for they shall be filled. And these, in these lessons, they're each a stepping stone here for, for us to find happiness. Happiness through Christ and through God the Father. So, um, first of all, what does merciful mean? This again is Capernaum, where Christ was actually having his, his uh, sermon. And uh, the merciful um, means pitiful, merciful or compassion, having compassion or being compassionate. Jesus gives us steps to follow, and each one of these steps you realize your need for him. As you come to him, you realize your spiritual poverty, and then you come and mourn for your forgiveness. You come to him in meekness and in lowliness of heart, and then we start searching God's word. And we are now hungry for His Word and we thirst after His righteousness. You hunger and thirst after righteousness. The Holy Spirit then starts to grow in your heart and you feel compassion for God. You start obtaining mercy. You start seeing the, and start having pity for people. You start, stop seeing the needs of yourself and you start seeing the needs of others. Matthew 25, 31 through 46 is the parable of the sheep and the goats. And I'm going to read through that because it's such a good lesson for us. Uh, we, can, we can draw a sermon just out of this, but uh, let's just quickly read through this. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. This is found in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And in verse 32, And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, and the goats on the left hand. Then shall the king say unto him on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when shall we thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch you have done it into one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, 
Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took not me in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and imprisoned, and you visited me not. Then shall they say also, answered unto him, saying, Lord, when saw we a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, or did minister unto you? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of these, the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So we see here, deeds and mercy are presented as a test to the admission to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We see here that there are deeds that we as Christians must do on this earth. Now I have often thought about, oh boy, I haven't given enough money to the poor, or I haven't fed the people, or I haven't given them drink. But you know, it doesn't mean it just physically, it means it spiritually. So, have you helped those that are poor in spirit? I hope you have. And have you helped those that are seeking God? Yes. Have you fed those with that hunger and thirst after righteousness? Yes, we pass out literature. We talk to the people. So God is not talking only physically here. It's, it's also spiritually. So in what, what is one of the ways that we can show mercy to others? In James verses one through tw- verse, or chapter one, verse twenty-seven, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this: to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. He also requires us to do this. Micah six verse eight: He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? but to just love justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So he wants us to be just. He wants us to walk humbly and to be merciful to people. In other words, he wants us to put on his character. He wants us to be like him. Just to, just to be with us, to show mercy to others and walk humbly. To be meek. And what, we, we can only do this through him. The parable of the Good Samaritan. We'll go through that too. That's also in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. And Jesus said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. This is talking to us as Christians. We can't pass by people that we think, oh, they don't know God. They're not really spiritually discerned. They're not even Christian. So I'm not going to bother to talk to them today. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and he saw him, and he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, giving him the Spirit of God. And set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took, him, took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And he said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Blessed are the merciful. There is a blessing ministering to others. In Acts 20, verse 35, it tells us, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, It is more blessed to receive than to, than, or more blessed to give, excuse me, than to receive. And we notice that in Christmas, birthdays. We especially as parents, when we give our kids our presents and see the, their, their eyes light up. We are to show mercy unto others. We are not only to forgive, to, to not only to give our, of ourselves, but we also are to, for, to forgive others as he has forgiven us. 
Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. That's found in his prayer. This also shows mercy. Peter asked Jesus, how many times do we forgive others? Seven times? He thought, wow, that's a lot, seven times. And what does Jesus answer? Seventy times seven. What I thought's interesting is 70 times 7 is 490, which is also 490 years, which is also the 7 week, 70 week prophecy that at the end of that 70 week prophecy, what happened? God gave us mercy. So there's a little, little prophecy that Christ was saying there to Peter too. There, the, in Matthew 18, 23 through 35, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents, which in today's money is literally millions of dollars. This was a huge amount in that time. But before, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Have mercy upon me. Then the Lord of that servant was moved, servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. Wow. And his fellow serpent fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But when he cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow serpents saw what, we, what was done, they, they were very sorry, and came and told him of the Lord that was done. And then his Lord, after that he had called him, and said unto him, O oh, wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt, because thou desirest me, you had me plead, have mercy upon you. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on your fellow servant, even as I have pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth, and he delivered him to the tormentors till he should be paid that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. God warns us here to follow this message. He was instructing his disciples and us today to have mercy upon others. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Be an example. We must put on God's character. We cannot do this on our own though. We must ask God to be come into our hearts and to change it. When we come to God and Jesus the King of Heaven and realize the sins that we have committed, when we realize a great debt that we owe Him for the forgiveness of those sins, then we realize how impossible it is to pay Him back. Can we ever repay back God for His forgiveness? No. What amount of work could we possibly do? The wages of sin are enormous and it's impossible to repay Him. We ask Him for His forgiveness with grace and mercy, God forgives our sins and covers us with His robe of righteousness and blots out our sins. He shows us tremendous mercy. And, and how much mercy shall we show to others who sin against us? Is there someone in your life that you can't forgive? We must learn to forgive everyone who has sinned against us and have the tender mercy of God towards them to receive His grace. In Matthew 6:14. 15, uh, verses 14 and 15, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. It's not that God can't forgive you, but if we don't forgive others, we're not going to feel forgiven ourselves. God shows mercy towards us first, and then we pay it forward. We must share it. John said last week to pay it forward, and I had to put it in this message. Ephesians 4.32, it says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Jesus was our greatest example. In 1 Peter 2.23, Jesus was hanging on the cross naked. 
He was beaten. He was tortured. And it says here in verse 23, Who, when he was reviled, reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Can you imagine? He was dying there on the cross. And he still loved them that hated him. Luke 23, 34, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for, not, well, no, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and they cast lots. Unforgiven, unforgiveness is a poison. It's an acid that lives inside you. And if you keep it inside you, what does acid do? It will corrode you and it will eat you up. We have to get rid of it. In Christ Objects Lessons, page 251, Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful toward others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. The tide of divine compassion flows into the, in, through the soul, sinner's soul and from him to the souls of others. The tenderness and mercy that Christ has revealed in his own precious life will be seen in those who become sure of his grace. But if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 8 verse 9. He is alienated from God, fitted only for eternal separation from Him. God's church, God's people, which is also God's church is in our heart, is love and merciful. The golden rule, 712, said this earlier, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. How often do those who are kind and considerate of the needs of others, gets repaid by others with tenderness, kindness, and mercy. Those that have the most love for people, the most tenderness for people, the most merciful mercy to people, usually has the most people at their funerals. Have you noticed that? Next is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So now we come to Christ, we bow ourselves before Him. We come in meekness, we're pliable. We now can be molded by Him. We seek Him through His Word, through His grace, through His Spirit. And we are filled. And then we obtain mercy. And when we show others mercy, now we can see God. You see how the steps are there. Blessed are the, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart means clothed with the robe of righteousness. We must be pure in heart and clothed with His righteousness if we want to be at the wedding feast in heaven. In Matthew 22, 11 and 12, And when the king came to see the guest, he saw there a man that didn't have a wedding garment on. And he said unto him, Friend, how comest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Our heart designates this intellect, the conscience. God knows what is in our hearts and what, our, what is in our minds. We must have a clear conscience to see God and feel the confidence, and feel the confident uh, in the confidence in Him, in us. We must have, for us to receive that confidence, we must be in Him and know that He's in us, in our heart. In 1 John 3, verse 20 and 21, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. Our hearts must be filled with meekness and a quiet spirit, not one that is corruptible. In 1 Peter 3, verse 4, But let it be hidden man, hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight of God, of great price. God does not want us to be caught naked in the day of the wedding feast. He wants us to be clothed with righteousness. Just like the Laodicean church, we don't want to be caught naked. He wants us to be clothed. In Revelation 19, verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. 
He wants us to have the perfection of character. And to get that perfection, we have to go through trials. In Revelation 3, 18 and 19, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of the nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, and thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If your motives are right, if your motives are pure, then your life will be pure. In Matthew 15, verses 18 through 20, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, adulteries, fornications, theft, fault witness, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not. What was happening here is Christ was eating without washing his hands. Sadducees and Pharisees had a law that said, if you eat without washing your hands, you're dirty and unclean. And Christ was trying to tell them it's much deeper than that. In Matthew 23:25, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. God is interested in our hearts, on the inside of our hearts. Those with pure hearts, those that have forsaken sin, their lives are preserved and consecrated to God. In Romans 6, 14 through 16, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? No. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And in Romans 14, uh, 8, chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And if so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Pure in heart does not mean sinless, though. But it does mean that our motives are right. Because we cannot become sinless. But our motives can become right. They, that by the grace of Christ you have turned your back on past mistakes and you're pressing forward towards the perfection of Jesus Christ living through you. That's what this means. In Philippians 3, 13 through 15, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ, God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything be ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Being pure just means renewing our right heart, renewing our spirit, being free from sin, being reborn from our old self and putting on the righteousness, the robe of righteousness and coming to the throne of God in His glory. In Romans 6.22, But now being made free from sin and being servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the, and the end everlasting life. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us clean ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Ephesians 4.24 And that ye put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In 1 Thessalonians 3.13 To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in the holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. And in Hebrews 12.14 
It says here, or uh, chapter 12, verse 14, For as many uh, follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Righteousness is imputed, is, is by faith, and um, is imputed righteousness. We come to Him poor in spirit, and then we seek meekness, and mourning, and humility, and then we, He starts to feed us. That's justification. Then our humble hearts, He molds us to be merciful, and to be pure in the spirit. That starts sanctification. So, when you see here justification by grace, that's pretty easy. We come to Him, He covers us, that's pretty easy. But sanctification, now, that's part of growth. A lot of people say that's hard. That's where a lot of people stop. We come to Christ and we're covered with His robe of righteousness, but we don't enter into the holy place where we don't search for His Word and witness and pray. Jesus wants us to grow because He wants us to be in His character. That's how we receive true happiness. In Psalms 15, verse 2, He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteously and speaketh the truth in his heart. John 1, 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Wow, wouldn't that be wonderful if Christ said that about us? 1 Timothy 5.22 Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins, but keep yourself pure. In Isaiah 35, verse 8, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wafering man, though fools, shall not err therein. 1 Peter 2, 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and a guile and hypocrisies, hypocrisies, excuse me, and envies and all evil speakings. And then 1 John 3, verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Christ places emphasis of divine grace in the hearts of men in this present age, and not just in the eternal glory of the age to come, we can see God spiritually as well as physical sight. In other words, those who are poor in spirit can enter into the kingdom of heaven now. Those who are mourn shall be comforted now. Those who are humble-hearted and receive their title to their new earth now. Those who hunger and thirst for the righteousness of Jesus can be filled now. The merciful obtain mercy now. And in like manner, those that are pure in heart have the privilege of seeing God now through the eyes of faith and eventually in the glorious kingdom of heaven. It will be a privilege to see Him face to face. It says here in 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear that we shall be but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And Revelation 22, 4, And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Only those who develop a heavenly vision in this present world will have the privilege of seeing God in the world to come. Satan entices us with drugs, with alcohol, entertainment, music, food, movies, to becloud our faculties of mind. I have heard people say in the past that, oh, there's certain drugs out there that will expand your mind. You can see God clearer. The serpent, the devil, Satan, has used this with the very first parents on this earth. He enticed Eve with the fruit of the tree. And he charmed Eve. In Genesis 3, verse 6, And when the woman saw that tree that was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired of, to make one wise, she took of the tree, of the fruit, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And then Satan says, Genesis 3, verse 5, For God doth know what in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. 
and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil first blinds us by persuading them to believe that experience with drugs, alcohol, etc. will give them clear insight. I heard even from our own children, well, our house was so strict, you didn't let us do anything, so now when we get out of it, you want to experience it. Crazy thing. This is another lie of Satan. Sin leads to further blindness. Christ says, sinners have eyes, but they see not. Jeremiah 5.21 Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Isaiah 6.10, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Ezekiel 12, verse 2, Son of man that dwellest in the midst of rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Christ tells us that with the singleness of heart we shall see God. With the eye of the, with, when the eye of the soul is single, the life will be full of light. In Matthew 6, 23 the light of the body is of the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light is that thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Christians today get a little cross-eyed because we keep our eye on God in heaven, but we have our eye down here on sin. Our eye is fixed with, on pleasures here, but we try to be fixed in heaven above. Moses chose to, su- to suffer affliction and to enjoy the pleasures of sin with the Pharaoh's daughter. That's found in Hebrews 11, 25, and 26. And then, we must keep, God's, keep God first in our life. The window of the soul must be kept clean if we want to see God. Sin dims the spiritual vision so that men cannot behold God. If we want clear discernment for spiritual truth, all impurity of speech and of thought must be shunned. Selfishness keeps us from God. Only the selfish heart, the humble and trustful spirit, shall see God as we see Him. Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed the Lord, Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundance and goodness and truth. Genesis 32, 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Deuteronomy 5, 4. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount of the midst of the fire. Deuteronomy 34.10 And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. This happened in this present world. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said also, O, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. God promises no more curse in heaven, and we shall see him. And, we will, and He will seal us in our foreheads as we... Oh, it's already there. For Revelation 22, 3 and 4. And there shall be no more cor- cor- curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. That's our promise. God wants us to put on the whole character of God. And sometimes when we talk about the commandments of God, we, we really focus on the Sabbath. But He wants us to do all, four, all ten of the commandments because that is His character. That's His seal. The whole, com- the whole covenant is His seal. So God wants us today to come in those steps, come to your knees, beg forgiveness, receive His Word and His mercy. Then we in turn show people our mercy then we become pure, and then next week we're going to find out how we can become peacemakers. And then we'll figure out what God really wants us to be and how we can really find true happiness today. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God.